this time on River Hunters. In the shadow of one of Britain's greatest castles, we're battling the forceful River Tees. Tell them I have a coin on my fingertips. In the 1500s, this was where North battled South in a grisly attempt to overthrow Queen Elizabeth I and claim the throne for Mary, Queen of Scots. We'll be searching for lost Tudor relics and secrets of this ancient borderland. What we've got here is probably the most exciting object that we could have found from the river. I'm Rick Edwards. There you go. And I love a bit of wild swimming. But no one knows rivers like this guy, YouTube sensation Bo Wimet. That's great, isn't it? He's a real life river hunter and has spent over 30 years searching for relics in rivers across America. Go for it! Now Bo has come to Britain, a country with some proper history. Absolutely incredible. To join me on a mission to scour these unexplored waterways. <coughs> and unearth the secrets of Britain's past. One more pumped up. Look at that. It's a musket ball. Oh, that is officially treasure. Could be. Get under there. Together, we are the River Hunters. The River Tees, County Durham. A powerful waterway with a turbulent past. Just 70 miles from the Scottish border, the Tees lay on a bloody fault line between north and south. Since Roman times, the area was rife with raids and rebellions. To defend this vital region, the English built strategic fortresses, many near the river's edge. These waters have never been searched until now. We're starting our search at the formidable Barnard Castle, famed for its role in a gruesome 16th century siege. Discovering lost items here could help us piece together more of what happened in this castle's violent past. I guess you need to be patient and lucky. Oh, lucky. Luck is always part of it. But, you know, luck comes to those who are prepared. Yes, and, and we're prepared, aren't we? We're pre oh, yes. well, I mean, you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> I <don't know> if <laughs> I am. Well, yeah, well. Look at this. A bit of castle wall. Is that the castle? So, river down here. And, yes. Oh, man. There it is. All right, let's go a good spot and have a look at this castle. Yeah. Here we go. Yes, look at amazing. that. And the river's right there. Yeah, you can hear it. It's right on top of the river. It is. Castle. It is. I, I didn't realize it was that close, and that just makes me super psyched that we're actually going to find stuff out there. The siege of 1569 was a major event in the rebellion known as the Northern Uprising, in which Catholics from the north of England rose up against Protestant Queen Elizabeth I. Their aim was to seize the crown and replace Elizabeth with her cousin once removed, Mary, Queen of Scots. 5,000 of Mary's supporters surrounded the castle, determined to force its occupants into submission. Before we get in the water, I'm meeting historian Andrew Stables to find out more about how this violent rebellion all began. Well, it was Queen Mary, Queen of Scots, who was brought down to Bolton Castle from Scotland, who was Catholic. And of course, Elizabeth was Protestant. So what the Northern Lords were trying to do was to bring Mary back to the uh, throne of England. So ultimately, it was Catholics from the North against Protestants from the South. Yeah, that was it. The Northern Lords, they raised a force in Richmond, which is about 15 miles down the road, and brought that force to this castle. How long did the siege last for? It was lasted for 11 days. Under Elizabeth's Catholic predecessor, so-called Bloody Mary, Protestants have been persecuted mercilessly, meeting their end through grisly torture and mass burnings. If Barnard Castle fell to the Catholic enemy, the Protestants inside would have worried they'd face a similar gruesome fate. They were desperate to get out, as were local Catholics, also trapped inside the castle. Many took drastic action to escape. 
250 people who were holding out in the castle jumped over the walls to rejoin some of their colleagues and friends on the Catholic side. Jumped over the walls? Yeah, jumped over the walls. Contemporary accounts record that 35 of those who jumped broke their legs, arms and necks. And this is the place where they would have been jumping from, perhaps. Oh, you'd have to be really desperate yeah, to be I'm... jumping down there. Yeah. With people jumping off the castle walls and potentially into the river, the waters below could hold grisly secrets. Time to begin our search. We have special permission to get in the river at a protected site. It's the first ever archaeological search in this spot. Oh, wow. So you can imagine the, the northern rebels getting to this point in 1569, looking up at that castle and thinking, right, what are we going to do? Exactly, and, and that's why rivers are so important for protection. It's like having a moat, Yeah, you know? That makes it the perfect place to find items from the castle and the siege. But the Tees has claimed numerous lives. The waters may be low now, but searching here isn't without risk. The conditions of the river here are kind of scary, actually. Quite swift, there's lots of rocks and they're all covered with algae, so it's going to be very, very slippery. Remember, this thing floods. Yeah. Big time floods is very dangerous and come up just like that. So I'm sure there's lots of trees that come sweeping down through here. They'll drag the bottom, flip stuff up. Gonna be dangerous. Don't slip on the rocks. Oh, I'm not. Remember, slip, slip the bang your head, you're drowned. Funny because I like swimming in my leisure time. I wouldn't look at this fast moving river with loads of slippery rocks and think, great, let's get in. Um, but Bo's pretty insistent that this is a good spot, so uh, we're going to do it. I think what we better do, uh, since that's so swift... Oh, uh, hello. ...is get low. Slippery. Okay, so we might yeah, have let's to get just low. kind of float across. And am I floating on my, on my front or my back? Although it might seem simplest to swim across, the safest way to cross a fast-flowing river like this is on your back. Oh, here I go. Come on. Using your feet and legs as shock absorbers to push off the rocks. Safely across, Bo's taking us to a shallower pocket to begin our search. All right, you ready? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just doing kind of long, slow sweeps with the detector, just listening out for any consistent beeps. I'm not getting any at the moment. Even when I do get a signal, tracking it down won't be easy. So you really can't see very much at all, partly because of the movement of the water, but also because the, the source of the water in the Pennines is quite peaty, so the water is quite dark. So you're really relying entirely on the detector. But like the pro he is, Bo's already got a lead. Nice little squeaker right there. That could be something good. It's a good, good, solid signal. Kind of high, hoping it's silver. <sighs> it's a coin! Not a very old one, though. Two pence. I think I could probably buy an appropriate little gift for Rick with a two pence. Oh, thanks, Bo. You are too kind. Meanwhile, I think I might have just found something a little more intriguing. Oh, hang on. You got... Could it be lost evidence from the castle's siege? Got it? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, yeah. so here's what you do. Okay, like underneath this rock. All right, so keep it down there so it's a yeah. solid buzz. Yeah. An alternative is, of course, just put on the mask and look. You might see the glint of gold. I'm just going to go in and I'm going to see if I can uh, spot a glint of gold. And if I do, I'm going to come up celebrating. <laughs> It's a bit of, not that old, copper. Yeah, it is probably copper. Because we're an official archaeological dig, the exact position of even small finds like this 
needs to be carefully recorded. Let's go ahead and get this logged in, even though that doesn't seem important, it could be. OK. Yeah, who knows? At first sight, this might just look like scrap metal, but appearances can be deceptive. To help us in our search, we've called in Gary Bankhead. He's one of a few diving archaeologists who have made finds in rivers before. And Bo wants to pick his brains for his local knowledge of this waterway. Our seasonal floods that we get, these big winter floods, and on occasions during the summer as well, the, the level of water goes up 10, 15 feet, and the power just it strips this bedrock. So anything that we're going to find here will be deep in these gaps and these cracks. Like almost like concrete you have to get through. Finds may be buried deep, but Bo is coming up with the goods. All right, <laughs> we got it. It's a big piece of something. Oh, dude, check it out. That's heavy. <laughs> Fantastic, a flat iron. What do you think that would be, too? No, I think probably Victorian. Big heavy weight. That's pretty cool, though. Next, it's my turn. Oh, that's a nice find, Rick. It's heavy. I've got my little brush here. Did you get a signal on it or not? No, no, I just saw it in the water. Just give it a, give it a brush with the... Um, where the name is? It's Housebreak. A cow. Yeah, cow. 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 Yeah. C O W. Cow. And probably trace the manufacture of the bricks. Cow. Yeah. The Cow family business that made this brick wasn't just famous for manufacturing. MP Joseph Cow was also a major radical force in Victorian politics. Descended from factory workers, he campaigned for everything from voting reform to miners' rights, and even the cause of European radicals like the Italian revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi. It means this humble brick is a reminder not just of this region's industrial past, but also one of the North's most fiery reformers. This stretch of river is proving a rich hunting ground, and it's not long before we have another intriguing find on our hands. Watch out, Gary. An iron rock. Really? Like a hot rock. I don't know what this is, but I certainly think this is man-made. Yeah. It's got this, look at the curvature right here. Yeah. Right there. Flip it on the other side. It's a I rock. think it's ceramic. If Did you, you get a signal on that? On that? Did you? Well, I'm going to just try the pinpoint and see what we get. It's man-made, but it's rock, so it's carved. But why is, why is it giving up a signal? Who knows? Yeah. Who knows what it is? But strange find, though. An iron rock. A rock that sets off a metal detector is something of a mystery. But after a bit of a clean-up back at base, it looks like Gary might just have an explanation for this bizarre find. What we've got here is probably the most exciting object that we could have found from the river. Really? We've got part of a bread oven. No. Have we? Yeah. Now, this is very, very likely a medieval bread oven. This is a block of clay, but it gives a signal in the metal detector. Right. Um, so it's an anomaly. Why would that happen? But basically, this is clear, but it's been superheated. And the very fact that that's happened means that um, the minerals inside generate an electric field. It, it's magnetised, essentially, so it gives off a really strong signal. So what, what shape is this oven? A bit like a beehive, beehive oh. dome. So if we've got that circular shape there, and we just put it down, and we drew a large circle around there, just following that circumference. A bit of work out there, yeah, yeah, yeah. The domed beehive oven was pioneered in the Middle Ages. Made of clay and repeatedly heated to high temperatures, the minerals inside have grouped together to form iron oxide. So much so, it set off our metal detector. Almost certainly used in the castle, but it's failed. Eventually, after baking thousands and thousands of loaves of bread, yeah it's actually given where it's failed. So if you had a big chunk of used oven, where better just to throw it off the castle Straight wall? Straight in the river, yeah. You know, Buy a new right one. Right off the walls, yeah. right? So this is yeah. a wonderful piece of Barnet Castle's medieval history. It speaks of the people who were in the castle. Imagine being an army that was being sieged. You had to feed the army. And what better to, to cook thousands and thousands of loaves of bread is, is this clear baker's oven. So possible evidence of castle life during the time of the siege and before. Gary's also looked at the piece of metal I found, and I'm intrigued to know what it could be. I've been doing a bit of research. This is copper alloy, and there's a little bit of black paint on there. Yeah. And the letter O. Uh -huh. There's a huge clue on the other side, yes. and it says anode. 
So we're almost positive this is from a battery unit. We can date this relatively easy. The font's a big clue. This is copper alloy. Modern batteries don't have that. Um, not made of copper. Oh. Actually, it speaks of important time in British history. This is almost certainly dated to the Second World War. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's excellent. It's a wonderful yeah. find. You found Really, really happy about that. A part of British history, maybe a military vehicle, even a searchlight. It is a really interesting find. Well done, you. Dad. Yes, Great, Dad. I'm really chuffed. One military vehicle that was definitely common in these parts was the bomber. During World War II, Barnard Castle was just 20 miles from RAF station Middleton St George. It was once home to the 76th Squadron, part of Bomber Command, an offensive that dropped over a million tonnes of bombs on occupied Europe by the end of the war. Teesside was itself also a major target for German bombers, determined to knock out one of Britain's industrial heartlands. It's a reminder that even long after the 16th century siege, this area has been shaped by major conflict. You can speculate quite a lot and that's quite fun and you probably never really know how that bit of battery ended up. Did it come from the sky? Has it just been discarded? It's not what we were looking for, but it is still something. And now I feel quite, uh, I'm quite buoyed up and I'm ready. I'm gonna find some more stuff. And after studying a map of the area, I've got a hunch about where we should be moving our search. So we're in Barnard Castle. Castle's here. What do you see? Well, the river's flowing down past here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Makes a couple of loops. Mm -hmm. That's the bridge. That's the bridge. Looks like there should be a bridge here. I mean, the roads are coming down. So this is, a, this is an old Roman road. Straight line. Old Roman road here, straight line. And so you assume there must have been a crossing here, either a Ford or a Roman bridge. That makes perfect sense what you're describing here. That road, it is a very straight road, and it's yeah. like it just all of a sudden it makes a dog leg. Yeah, you know, which so. the Romans went into that. Yeah. The Romans were famous for building ruler straight roads that allowed their armies to mobilize quickly. So, in all likelihood, they would have simply built a crossing straight across the river. This would have been used for centuries after the Romans. So if we track down where it used to be, there could be a treasure trove of finds. My theory is that the Roman bridge had to have crossed at this point here. And this is the narrowest point yeah, with high banks. So where are we going to go? Where's the best place to die? I would today? say river left. River left. Right below where we think the bridge is. OK. And that's a great spot because it's at the bottom of the castle. Anything lost off our Roman bridge ends up down there. Quite lively, this current. Yeah. Like, I'm not loving it. <laughs> Once we make our way to the deeper pools downstream, it's the perfect place to find objects washed down from the likely spot of the ancient crossing. So here we are. You see how the floor drops right off here, and this is ideal. Even though our hopes are high for Roman relics, our first find is a little more modern. What's all this wiring? That's copper wiring yep. coming, coming out of a big chunk of lead. I'll let you guess first. I have absolutely no idea. I've never seen anything that looked like this. I think this is a lightning conductor. And this would be the earthen rod. That would make sense. Yeah. So that would be buried deep in the ground, well, a few metres down. Yeah. And that would run to the length of the building. And the only tall building we've got here is our castle, which may have once had a lightning oh, there. I'm on a roll of finds, and this relic looks strangely familiar. This is, uh, it certainly looks like the old bread oven, doesn't it? It's the bread oven. Oh, look at that little groove there. Yeah. Like, like on the other bit, there's that bit that looks like it might be a little kind of shelf or ledge, and that's... Fancy painting two chunks of Hello. bread oven within Amazing. 100 metres of each other. But that... Excellent. Six, seven, eight hundred years old. Now Bo spotted something that doesn't need a metal detector. Oh, wow! <laughs> Lucky! Look at this, Rick. <laughs> it's a nose of, I would say, a horse. Is that an eye socket on, the, on that side? You spin it round? Yeah, but what's this? 
That's it. It's nose. Nick, yeah. You can just see where the teeth. Teeth. I don't know. Yeah. Man. Is that a nice? I don't sock? think it's a horse. It's just wash that in the water a second. <laughs> yeah. That's a lovely. Look at that eye socket there. That's definitely a horse. It is. Yeah. yeah. That's great. A Roman horse. That's incredible to find a, <laughs> a horse skeleton here. With these signs of life from the castle and potential crossing, it feels as if we're getting ever closer to a find of real historic value. And Bo's spidey senses are tingling. You feel something right here. Feels like a coin. Have you had a look at it? Yeah, I could clearly feel like the edge, but it was wedged. I couldn't move it. I got a really good signal there, and it sounds like a coin on the machine. I took a quick peek at it. I feel it with my fingers. Um, almost positive that's what it is. This may be a coin, but for now it's jammed tight between the rocks and could have been there for centuries. And now it looks like we might have another in our sights. Hey guys, come and have a look at this. I've got my hand on a coin. Really? It's there. I can see it. I'm not going to lose it. Three quarters embedded in the rock. Mm. You see that? Mm -hmm. We're going to really struggle to get this out. I'm obviously no expert, but... It's really deeply embedded, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Got this chisel. Uh -huh. um, obviously, the important thing is not to damage the coin. Of course, If yeah. this coin is in a little crack, we need to work around it. Even after Gary's coin extraction masterclass, I'm still struggling to get it out. And Bo's having the same problem. I'm too tight in the rocks. I don't think I'm going to be able to get this. With daylight fading, we'll have to call it a day and try again tomorrow. We've got to get that coin out. I'm so excited about that coin. I know, I know it's going to be a good one. So we have two coins, two coins in the water right there. So when you get the coin, we're going to get it out without any damage at all, no mechanical damage. We've got loads of time. I got a better coin, you know. I got a more historical coin than you. My coin's older you than yours. No, mine's, mine's in better shape, Don't at least. <laughs> two pence. Two pence. <laughs> no. <laughs> Come on. While the guys get going digging up their treasure, I want to find out more about what other relics have been found in the river. Some of the most interesting finds are stored here, at Bowes Museum, where I've come to meet curator Dr Jane Whittaker. Hi, Jane. Hello. Nice to meet you. And it turns out that the first find she's chosen to show me has a rather macabre origin. I'd like to show you a very fine piece found in 1967 by someone fishing uh, in the river. This is um, an, a bucket urn which is thought to have be Bronze Age. Bronze and age. it was wow. protruding out of the bed of the river. Should we take it out? Yeah. And so what would an urn like this have contained? Is it ashes? Inside it were the cremated remains um, of a human. And when analysis was done, there were some teeth. The, the dental records showed that the human was about five or six years old. What they couldn't tell was whether it was a boy or girl. Right. Interestingly, it's part of a sort of tradition of urns of this type being found in this area and southern Scotland. Um, and all the other urns also had had, had um, held cremated remains. That's a fantastic find and it's very heartening. You can find that kind of piece in the river around here. The museum contains finds from right across the region's history. So I'm curious to see if anything's been found relating to the siege of Barnard Castle. So we have here some of the cannonballs which um, were found around the site of Barnard Castle, believed to be from the, uh, the siege of 1569. The, the Northern Rebellion? Absolutely. Aha! Can I touch them? Yes. So these would have been actually lighter than I would have expected. You think? They'd yeah, have I mean, still I'd knocked you out if they Oh, I think, you. yeah, I mean, if it catches me, yes. <laughs> I'd know about it, wouldn't I? Yes. Under attack from projectiles like this, 
the castle finally fell to the Catholic rebels after 11 days. But it was all in vain as Elizabeth didn't lose her crown. The uprising was defeated and over 700 rebels were executed. And so these were found whereabouts? Well, within the um, perimeter of the castle. Not in the river, then? No. The fact that these siege relics were only found on the land side of the castle doesn't bode well for our river search. But Bo and Gary are determined to carry out one final hunt here for their coins. Bo! I found my coin Is here. It? Yeah. Excellent. I'm going to start clearing around it. Loosening the rock around Gary's coin is a serious challenge. I've been working on it for about five, ten, well, ten, fifteen minutes. I clean around it and it's sitting vertically. So it's, it's just ready to pop out of the hole. Okay. It's loose. It's loose. Uh, it's good to show you. Yeah, I see good. it. Okay. Yeah, they're beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So we're going to bring them out. Let's bring them out. <laughs> After one final push, Gary finally has hold of his treasure. There we go. Look at that. What is it? What is it? Oh, it's a button. It's a button. Oh, it's a lovely find. It's a dandy button. That, kind of, that would date probably what, late 1700s? Yeah. 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 Originally worn by stylish 18th century gentlemen known as dandies, this button is a fascinating find. We find these in America too, just like this, these big dandy button. Look how sharp the edge of that is. Yeah. I mean, the force of the water and the rocks rolling and raging down here during floods have just smoothed it right out. I mean, that's almost dangerous. That's a knife's edge <laughs> of a button. You're right. Isn't that cool? Let's get out of here. Yeah. Up on the riverbank, Bo wants to know more about the British dandy who would have worn this. So a person of high standing might wear a button like that? Almost certainly worn by a gentleman, a fashion conscious man, mm. um, and that's typical of that style. Big, large um, buckles worn, you know, all the way up the coat. Would have been almost looking like gold when it was, when it was new. And so that in itself is a lovely little find. Dandies were the hipsters of their day. The style reached its peak in the early 19th century, when extravagantly dressed young men like notorious poet Lord Byron became the first modern celebrities. Cartoons from the time lampooned the effeminate fashion style of these dandies that scandalised the establishment. Ornate gilded buttons were the perfect finishing touch to outfits designed to show off both daring dress sense and decadent wealth. How do you think it got in the river? I'm guessing somebody would not have thrown away yeah. an elaborate button like that. If there was a bridge there, did he fall off? Did he drown? Yeah, murder. Murder. Who knows? <laughs> he threw really? Off, Who knows? Thrown off the castle? Yeah. Yeah. Back at the river, Bo is fired up and determined to dig out his coin. Well, it's going to be just so exciting to pull it, it is. out, isn't it? it? Is. It's really, really tight. The rocks are cemented in this area for some reason. They're almost impossible to get out. I'm going to try to pick around the edges and see if I can get some of the little pebbles off to the side, and then we might be able to grab it with our fingertips and just wiggle it just a little bit. Not an easy one, though. After some serious chipping, and potentially hundreds of years, the coin is free. But is it the Roman coin Bo is dreaming of? Here I have it! Hey, finally! I'm afraid to look at it. I don't know if it's coin, but I think it might be. But I'm gonna wait till Gary gets up here before I open my hand. I'm excited. Oh, I think, it? got, I think it's a coin. A coin, is it I really? I think it's a coin, yeah. It's got some age as well. This is, uh, it's well worn, it's well worn. I was, I'm a little bit nervous about that little hump right in the middle. Yeah. 
It's almost like a like a button shank to me. Yeah, it's got some but decoration on the out, on the outer edge there. Legend of the coin. Based silver Roman coin. Potentially. <laughs> this might. Do we have some hope? Yeah. Whoa, it's a tough one. We're gonna have to get in the um, get us under the microscope. Yeah. Get it back to the well, lab. Let's get this thing logged though. Yeah. I got my foot right where I found it. Okay. I'll get the GPS. Yep. I'll, I'll wait here and I'll uh, I'll look at it for a few minutes by myself. You hold up. <laughs> a great way to end our search around Barnard Castle. But just a few miles down the road is another key northern stronghold, Bowes Castle. Not belonging to our bow, but an imposing stone fort built right beside the site of a Roman camp. And that means the River Greta next to it could hide relics from through the centuries. And what's more, Gary's caught wind of a mysterious rumour. I've got some interesting information. Go on. Local superstition. I know I'm a professional archaeologist, but sometimes you, you hark back to the old superstitions. Uh -huh. Bose Castle, just up on the hill, prior to it being attacked and abandoned, the precious jewels and the gold were taken from the castle and they were hidden in the water at the bottom of that waterfall. They've never been recovered. Everybody in this area knows about it. The gold from Bose Castle is in that deep pool. Gary's story might seem far-fetched, but could it be that the River Greta really does hide a stash of buried treasure? So before we start our search, I'm back with historian Andrew Stables to find out more about this ancient fortress. Blimey, this is a hell of a structure. <laughs> I love it. See how thick the walls are. I mean, that is built to last, isn't it? Yeah. They may have used parts of the stone from the Roman fort to build it. So there's a Roman fort here, and then in the 12th century, another castle or keep built. Yeah because it was such a strategic spot. There's the crossing of the Pennines from Scotland. This area is effectively border country, or at least it was when the term, when this was built. So what kind of battles would this have seen? It'll have protected against border reavers. Reavers were raiders with no allegiance to anyone but their own family. Up until the 17th century, they terrorized the already fractious Anglo-Scottish border and Bowes Castle lay right on their path. Inhabitants of the castle may well have hidden gold or other riches to keep it from the invaders. But could a hoard of treasure really still be hiding in the Greta? There's only one way to find out. There we go. That's incredible, isn't it? I mean, look, it's flat, it's flat rock. Just imagine the people from the castle bathing, splashing in the water. Anything yeah. that fell out of their pockets, rings that might have come off their fingers, are sitting in these cracks right now. They were can't sink any further. Can't sink any further. The prospect of buried treasure has got a sight for one final push. And it looks like I might just have the first lead. Yeah, looking down a, a crack, getting a... Getting a pretty strong signal. I think it's about an 80% probability of something good. While I try my luck in the shallows, Bo's got another idea. Behind every waterfall, there are often air pockets, hidden recesses that might just make a perfect place to hide something. Have a decent little signal here, but it's wedged down in the rocks. I can feel something. I have it on my fingertips. I just can't get it loose. There's an air pocket in here. I can imagine the kids from the castle, from the Roman fort, coming and sitting right where I am, sticking their head under there, just like I did, and just enjoying life. A simple joy, the pleasure of life. And I might have a coin on my fingertips. I'm going back in. With a little help from Gary, 
I've finally found the source of all that beeping. Oh, he's out, he's out, he's out. Yeah, there it is there. This, it's something there. Oh, that's it there. Maybe a press stud with a pair of jeans or something like that. <laughs> That's part of the fun, though, Gary. It's part of the fun. Well, you can't always be a winner. But after several hours searching in the rain, I'm keen to know how Bo's got on behind his waterfall. So about you guys. I did not find any legendary gold. Nothing. Squat. That's why it's called legend. It's yeah. just a legend. I may have found... All very, very well hidden. Yeah. Now, I spent an hour looking for this thing and that waterfall up there. I don't think it's from the castle, do you? No, I think I know that coin. You've got an English penny. Lucky penny. <laughs> we might not have found the hidden bounty of Bo's castle, but we've still got some historical treasures from this trip. My relic from World War II, parts of a medieval clay oven from Barnard Castle, Bo's thrilled with the dandy button, and what we think might just be an ancient silver coin. But to see if our hunch is correct, Bo's come to the lab at Durham University to meet Gary and carry out a final verification. So what do you think it is? I'm thinking this is a hammered silver coin. That's what I want it to be. Now, when we got it up and it started to dry out a little bit, a hole appeared to make it look like maybe as a pendant. But it should have a little bit of silver in it if yeah. it's a hammered silver coin, yeah. I would think. So that's quite a large coin. If it was hammered silver, it would be a groat, something that size. Originally worth four pence, groats were first issued in the 12th century, shortly after Barnard Castle was built. To see if this coin does contain silver, Gary needs some technical assistance. So what exactly is this machine? It's just a, it's a portable device that we use to analyse metals. So we're going to line it up on the top there. I'm going to start running the live spectrum, OK? You can see the, the results starting straight away. So we're in luck. We've got, we've got something. And here we are. <gasps> so we've got 20% is CU. Copper. Is you, copper. Yeah. yeah. Um, and 7% zinc. A little bit of tin. So copper, zinc and tin is your answer. So what this is, is not an hammered silver groat. You are looking at a copper alloy object. If we look at this object again, this little artifact, it looks like a coin, but with a hole in. It's the, the thickness and its diameter are big clues. And there's every chance that if we remove some more of that concretion, we will reveal a coin. I'm pretty sure it is a coin just so badly worn and perhaps it's been reused somebody just hammered a nail through put it in a door frame or maybe suspended around the neck my guess is that is a scottish turner used in the 1600s turners or two pence pieces were legal tender in scotland only whereas silver coins were standardized with england in the first act of union in 1603. you'll have to ask gary what whose fine was best your dandy button or my possibly really cool old coin that's not silver, but possibly a good coin. I'll give you this. Yours is potentially dated to that post-medieval period, the 16th, 17th century. More is like yours? It. Does yours date to the post-medieval? No, yours is older. But... <laughs> that's all I needed to hear, my friend. Oh, I you win. Know, you're not you know getting, I did. No, you're oh, not getting yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a remarkable few days on the River Tees and Greta learning more about the extraordinary layers of history of this ancient borderland. All that hard work means it's time for just one thing, a well-deserved cuppa. I think we've had a fantastic couple of days, but I think what we have found tells a story. But because we were kind of coming here originally, going after the Elizabethan stuff, looking for evidence of that siege in the 16th century, the fact that we haven't really found any of that, it's a tinge of disappointment. But then what we have found kind of runs potentially ac across the ages. It absolutely does. Favourite find? I like the horse's head. I like the horse's head. Not only because it's beautiful, and it is beautiful, but I like it because it's organic. 
I mean, this was a living creature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This could have been a creature of the castle. I know what your favorite one is. Cool. It's a battery. It, do you know what? The battery is a close second for me. It's got to be this lump of red oven. Well, it's a wonderful thing. People needed these things to survive. So if you had to say who done better, find wise over the last couple of days. Are you sure, though, Bo, if you really think about it? Ruler, I can't believe you're doing this to me, dude. Come on. This is one. And you know it. You're just teasing oh, me, aren't you? Is it true? No, you I know. Good. I didn't realize that. Okay. You know, you're a good sport <laughs> up to now. <laughs>